This is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, on a very gray Wellington winter's day. A week ago, I gave a speech at the 2013 Composers Association of New Zealand Young Composers Workshop in Nelson. It was a very trying time for me as my hard drive crashed the night before I flew down to the South Island. This meant that I couldn't use the projector and had to draw everything on a whiteboard. To make matters worse, I forgot to turn on my outboard microphone when I videoed the speech. So for all my friends, colleagues, and subscribers, here's the speech the way it should have been presented. Re-recorded back here at home with all of the slides that I'd prepared, plus a few more images for my upcoming orchestration course. Hope you enjoy, and I'd appreciate any feedback or questions about the topic. If I were to write a book, it would be about this approach to orchestration, which I've mentioned in other videos here on this channel. When I started my talk, I made a few impromptu comments about orchestration training, and how I felt the common approach was deeply flawed. Most orchestration manuals are essentially textbooks about instrumentation, with some supplemental advice on the actual task of organizing a score and creating an arrangement. This treats the baseline of orchestration as instrumentation. But the scoring of music could use any collection of instruments, orchestral or not. And that's becoming a serious issue as orchestration becomes more multifaceted, cross-cultural, and experimental. There has to be a deeper, more fundamental approach to the study of orchestration that has a universal application for any combination of instruments, any style or culture of music, and any point of view. I hope that my speech contains at least the beginnings of a dialogue on how to get closer to that goal. Before I get started with some very technical topics, let's do a simple thought experiment. Examine the essence of this moment right now. First, the sensory data. You're sitting in a room with your colleagues, whom you can see arrayed and disarrayed around you, and from what you know, you can assume that they're sharing the same input, the slight chill in the air, along with the cloying, churning warmth from that heater over there, the pressure of the more or less comfortable chair against your back, the sounds from outside the room of practicing, talking, and distant traffic, and the sound from within the room of my slightly strange, trebly baritone, American-accented speech. Now that we've accepted all these simultaneous sensations, and more besides, perhaps a strange smell in the room, or the lingering flavor of this morning's breakfast, let's analyze the balance of the elements. From birth, we've gradually, carefully learned to prune the focus of our attention to disregard some sensations and accentuate others, particularly speech. That puts me at an advantage, because I know that within the context of a lecture, my voice, however weird-sounding, will trump everything else. So merely by coming here and sitting down at this particular time, you've accepted that the sound of speech will be the dominant sensation, and all other sensations must be adjusted to support that input, like shifting around in your chair, so that the discomfort of your bodily position doesn't become too distracting, for instance, or tuning out odd noises from outside or inside the room. We've examined the essence of the static elements of this moment. Now let's consider the dynamics, which I've chosen to define with the word function. What is the function of this moment? To observe, that's easy. But every observation also reflects on our sense of identity, which in turn is tied up with our own previous experience, prejudices, impulses, level of attention, and so on. We see patterns in everything, rhythms, chains of logic, and repetition, which helps us to make sense of the world of sensation. And making sense of things is the function of thinking. For example, we could say that, on top of observation, the function of this moment is to indulge in a thought experiment. Along with that, there are two interrelated corollaries, the first of which is that examining the essence of a moment starts to wear off as the moment gets longer and longer, and the second of which, what in the sweet name of Stravinsky does any of this have to do with orchestration? I'll get to that soon, I promise. But this speech wasn't composed with strict classical form in which the themes are stated bluntly and then developed with workmanlike precision toward an elevated perspective. Rather, in the spirit of excessive romanticism, I've disguised my themes inside an introduction that appears arbitrary on the surface, then in retrospect provides a model for further understanding. Even though we spent the first few minutes doing anything but think about orchestration, 
We are still applying a system of perception and analysis that I constantly use in my work. Texture, balance, and function. Over the course of 15 years as a working orchestrator, during which I've scored over 20 hours of compositions and arrangements, mostly for professional orchestras, I've learned one survival trick. Look for the underlying simplicity. No matter how subtle and complex some orchestral works may be, they all share the three basic characteristics I mentioned above. They all present an aggregate of simultaneous information to the listener, which I've defined as texture. This texture, in turn, has a shape to it, in which elements work together, or against one another, or at the expense of one another, or in support of one another. The simplest term for this is balance. Finally, the motion of each individual line in relation to other lines reveals the function of the music, harmonic, melodic, contrapuntal, and so on. I'm going to head off some objections right now by stating that the irreducibility of these three basic elements does not, in turn, make them independent of one another. Far from it. The act of defining a series of sounds as a musical composition necessarily requires that these building blocks be interdependent, sometimes in ways that the composer simply concocts without thinking about it. That's what we call inspiration, the ability to just feel what's right to do, wherein a logical and compelling idea springs forth without much calculation. But even in a cynically composed piece, or a slavishly academic one, the comprehensibility of the music's texture depends on intelligently balanced sonorities. These sonorities, in turn, must express the idea of the music, and if that idea is to succeed, it must embody the context of the texture within which it occurs. Let's examine these elements individually. I hope to show you that while each category is simple, it still encompasses a great deal of depth, grandeur, and intricacy.